This is Viticulture, where we share conversations with makers, growers, thinkers, and doers, folks who cultivate a good life. My name is Chris Missick, and I'm a lawyer turned winemaker in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, and I'm sitting down with great people in wine and other walks of life to hear their stories, learn their lessons, and take their advice on the perfect pairing. Our guest today understands the responsibility of living a good life. Paul Brock, together with his wife Shannon, own and operate Silver Thread Vineyards on the east side of Seneca Lake. Paul is also the director of the Viticulture and Enology program at Finger Lakes Community College, where they train up the next generation of winemakers and vineyard managers. He understands stewardship of the land and our responsibility to the community. If you like this content, please help us grow by liking this video on YouTube and subscribing to our show on your favorite podcast platforms. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. And check us out on all the major social media platforms. And now, here's the show. Today, it's an honor to have Paul Brock sitting in the interview chair. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine in a lot of ways. In fact, he was one of my professors when I attended the Finger Lakes Community College Viticulture and Enology program. He's been a stalwart of the Finger Lakes wine industry. He owns Silver Thread Vineyards with his wife, Shannon, on Seneca Lake. And he's done a lot, not just in teaching wine, but in living a great lifestyle, in living what we would like to say is a good life. He cares for the land, he cares for his students, and he cares about our industry. So thanks so much for coming, Paul. I really appreciate you asking me to be here, Chris. <laughs> I would love to kind of start out with a little bit of a biographical sketch because, you know, like, <laughs> like me, uh, you didn't start in the wine industry, but you found your way here. Yeah, I uh, grew up upstate New York, kind of a uh, blue collar. Um, and... Went to school uh, for chemical engineering at RPI. Uh, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. <laughs> um, I was the first one in my extended family on either side to ever graduate from college after, you know, right out of high school. Um, a big extended family. So it, it's, that was great. And then went into being an engineer, IBM, then ended up at the patent office down in D.C., uh, examining patent applications. And pretty quickly after I moved down there, I realized I was not going to be in an office for the rest of my life. And we, uh, well, who is now my wife, Shannon, uh, was not at the time. We came up with a five-year plan to get us into the Finger Lakes wine industry. Well, really to get me into grad school and then launch into the Finger Lakes wine industry. And um, so that was like 2000, January 2001 when we came up with a plan. We quit our jobs almost exactly at this time of year it was march 25th uh 2005 we went to new zealand uh ended up here in the finger lakes uh for me to go to grad school at cornell graduated there in 07 and uh head winemaker at one of the local vineyards and wineries uh and did an internship somewhere else and uh ended up at finger lakes community college in 2010 and we purchased my wife and i purchased silver thread in 2011 so that's about as short as i can make that story <laughs> that was a really busy stretch of time for you yeah 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 but uh it's worked out great and that was a that was a pretty hectic decade and this past decade's been hectic in a totally different way having two jobs and farming and making wine and teaching people how to do the same. So yeah. it's, it's been great. That's been great. great. So, I mean, not to make a joke out of it, but it's very typical for an engineer to come up with a solid five-year plan <laughs> that he then follows <laughs> through on. You know, it, I'd have to say Shannon was one of the idea to come up with a five-year plan. And, you know, we had a business plan for what our winery was going to look like. We probably started that in 2001 and it slowly evolved until we got here. And then at one point we totally scrapped it because we realized, well, it's just so expensive to buy land and to farm it and there's all these other brands and there's no way we want to throw another brand into this and you know both of us you and i have 
now purchased a brand and kept the name mm-hmm. that it came with. And there's real value in that of having something that somebody else started and taking that to the next level. And with Silver Thread, that's what we really were able to accomplish and are still accomplishing that and still moving on that and working on it every single day. You know, I think, um, and, and just so you know, we are actually about to change our name. Oh, yeah. Good. But I think that the most important thing is what that name that legacy that yeah. you're trying to carry forward is, yep. you know, Silver Thread, uh, it really, it references a waterfall, a gorgeous waterfall yep. on the east side of Seneca Lake. And not only that, your founder, Richard Fiegel, am I pronouncing that right? You are, yeah. Uh, was a pioneer Absolutely. here in the Finger Lakes. Yes, and he's he one of the names that's not mentioned nearly enough. So, you know, back in the late 70s, um, it was 77, end of 77, Richard was able to um, get a loan from the farmer who previously owned the land uh, to purchase what was at the time, I don't know, 10 acres of Catawba plus 35, 40 acres of other land. He turned around, increased the price on some of that and sold that to... uh, Kate and Rob Thomas, and they made shellstone on their part of that property. And uh, Richard started pulling out Catawba in 1978, finally got around to planting Riesling and Chardonnay in 82. Hmm. And that was the start of what is, you know, we still have some of those vines, uh, Silver Thread Vineyard. He uh, you know, farmed pretty conventionally. He was a he was a wine writer actually before he bought Silver Thread or bought that property. And uh his passion was doing everything, you know, very organically. Mm-hmm. And so, but he had to learn how to get there. So he used some conventional aspects, but then he quickly transitioned into organic. He actually had a uh, organic certification at mm-hmm. one point. And for various reasons that I don't fully understand, he had to give that up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it could have been proximity to other vineyards or whatnot, uh, but he continued to farm organically uh, right. right up till 2011 when he sold it to Shannon and I. Wow. And uh, it was pretty remarkable that he was able to do that. And, you know, some years were better than others. Yep. And that's pretty clear, but uh, he had it figured out. You know, recently I've gone over some of his old notes, which I re- feel really lucky to have. And uh, it, it's interesting to see so, some of the ways that he was able to get some su- success out of that. And, you know, it just, you know, we kind of did a 360. It was kind of like going back to the early 80s for Richard because I'm not a farmer. I wasn't a farmer. I'm a farmer now. I wasn't <laughs> a farmer at the time. And we really needed to figure this out for ourselves. Yeah. And so I went more of the conventional approach. We're using herbicides, um, where Richard had always been tilling. And, you know, I realized this is not the way I want to farm, uh, pretty quickly. So the past five, six years, we've really been going 360 full on back into trying to be or as organic as possible and an approach that we're really calling biointensive, mm-hmm. uh, farming. And it's really kind of a, a step out of the regenerative. It, it, well, it's very uh, compatible with what is uh, the, the hot buzzword of regenerative agriculture. Yeah. And so we stopped using herbicides back in 2016. In 2017, we really started looking at what a biological spray program looks like uh, to control the various diseases during the growing season that we have here in the Finger Lakes. And uh, we've been really successful um, with that approach and just... Um, really focusing more on the soil uh, to try and build the vine up that way. And it's been, it's been a really interesting uh, pathway. You know, we've got chickens on the farm now yep. <laughs> and I never really thought I'd have animals on the farm. And I'm just so, it makes me happy every day I see them there yeah. and uh, take care of them and eat their eggs and whatnot. So it's, it's fun. It is. And I think it's, it is uh, a, an important spiritual connection yep. to what we do. Yep. Two things. And then I do want to focus more on that. You know, having Richard Fiegel plant uh, vinifera varietals, sure. 77, 78. And what that tells me is how important the policy changes in New York were. The Farm Winery Act was passed in 1976. Yep. And so all of a sudden you had growers who were struggling to sell kind of bulk, inexpensive native or Labrusca grapes to mm-hmm. the big producers of jug wine. Yeah. 
they had to find a way to make their land profitable and to make something that consumers wanted. Um, or perhaps they didn't even know they wanted it yet. That's what I think is so fascinating about that era then. You know, it was a big risk. You know, Richard was writing about the world of wine, not necessarily about uh, the Finger Lakes. And these were the types of wines that he wanted to produce. And he really looked uh, to Herman Weimer for inspiration to see how can I grow Riesling in the Finger Lakes? And how do I grow Chardonnay that's not intended for sparkling wine? Because back in the time, that was when... um, The Chardonnay that was in the ground was really intended for gold seal Mm -hmm. sparkling wine and other sparkling wines. Uh, So he was looking to plant Chardonnay for still wine production. And it was interesting. You know, the the first four rows, of which we only have two left, uh, that he planted, he actually grafted himself. Hmm. Uh, which just, you know, speaking of connection to the land, there's, there's no better connection in viticulture than putting the plant material together. Cause we've got to understand too. And I understand that some people listening might not understand what I'm talking about right now, that the, the vines that you see above ground are not the same as the vines below ground. Um, there's diseases, there's insects in the soil that would, uh, prevent our Vitis vinifera, uh, Riesling, Chardonnay, Cabernets, uh, your French varieties, uh, mm-hmm. the varieties that all the wine that you've ever heard of uh, are made out of, uh, those vines couldn't survive below the ground. Um, and so what we didn't have to do is graft those vines onto rootstock. And uh, that uh, that process involves putting the vines together the year before you plant them mm-hmm. and propagating them as one vine. Mm-hmm. And so everything below the ground is one type of vine and everything above the ground is another type. And usually that's left to the nursery to do that. And, you know, I hope I never have to rip out those, those last two rows I have. I just walked by them this morning and it's just, I, I'm inspired every time I do it because I know that's a totally different business to get into and to do that yourself is just really cool. It is because there's so much that can go wrong in the process. Yep. And, and especially for folks listening who aren't familiar with this process, it isn't even just that you have to start the year before. You have to grow the root stock yes. so that you can graft <laughs> it onto that. And not only that, you have to continually change where you grow your new root stock because yep. you're concerned about nematodes in the soil, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he pulled it off. I, I don't, you know, I know he got some plant material at various places. Uh, But it's really interesting uh, that we have that legacy. Uh, And now when we talk about planting vineyards, especially with Riesling and Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, we we talk about different clones. And at the time, they weren't concerned with clones. So like, we have no idea what what kind of, or what what clone of Riesling or Chardonnay actually went in the ground, except we know that makes good wine. Exactly. Yeah. And just to talk about that parcel again, Mm -hmm. you know, Rob Thomas over at Shalestone, their famous slogan is we only do reds. Yes. Um, But they're really good reds. Yes. And kind of between your site and their site, what I think, and we're still generations away from actually understanding terroir Mm -hmm. of the Finger Lakes. Yeah. But we are discovering what are making pretty compelling wines yeah. from different hands, but the same pieces of land or nearby. Yeah. I mean, I always say that uh, Shellstone and Silver Thread share a site because uh, yeah. they're so similar. Uh, we have almost no soil over there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we've got, uh, when I say almost no soil, okay, so three, three and a half feet deep on shell, which is a, <laughs> you can't, the, the roots grow into the shell, but only occasionally. Yeah. Um, and it really makes the vines struggle. When it's a dry year, mm-hmm. our vines are small. And I was just talking to Seth, who's uh, you know, the next generation at Shellstone, uh, Seth Thomas. And he was saying, geez, the vines are small this year. And it, yep, yeah. they're very small. And it's just last year was dry. And our, we have very limited soil. Where, you know, for FLCC, the teaching and demonstration vineyard, which is at Anthony Road, there's 10 feet of soil there. Yeah. And... You know, that's a very different growing condition. And that's one of the things that makes the Finger Lakes exciting place to explore the wines is because we can have a site like where Silver Thread is, and then we can have other sites and we're nearby, but we're so different from each other. And the the wines produced from those sites are different, which is really cool. It's true. Your wife, Shannon, uh, I've heard her say many different times in different company 
that we are probably as close to just the canvas of a Burgundian model as you get. Yep. Because there are so many different soil types. You know, just the quick refresher, the soils here are not necessarily indigenous soils. They were deposited here during the Pleistocene, the, the glacial eras. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have these pockets based upon what the glaciers had picked up somewhere else and deposited there and ground down yep. where you can walk through a vineyard. And you're dealing with sandy loam in one point and, and gravelly loam and or, or maybe very little soil. There's lots of limestone in some pockets. Yep. Yeah, we've got this uh, band of limestone. And I don't know if Richard was aware of it, but that's where he planted Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Perfect. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I don't have to make that up. It's actually right there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, because the shale alternates with limestone. Yeah. And uh, it's fascinating digging. And I was just actually, we're going to be clearing a little bit of land, um, two, two and a half acres. And, um, you know, walking the, the land with the sky is going to help us, uh, do deep ripping and plowing and stuff and just prepare the land the right mm -hmm. way. And, uh, you know, he's like, we don't know what we're going to get when it's green. <laughs> once these trees are gone, it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> and, it it, and he, you know, he'd never been here before, but he knows about this type of work and these types of locations enough that it is going to be a nightmare <laughs> but it it's is. going to be fun and and you know next year we'll plant some vines and the year after we'll plant more and then five six years from now we'll just be making wine and it's amazing doing fun, fun stuff so the most exciting part about uh when we planted our vineyard so mm -hmm. i i found a parcel i i'd fallen in love with sure um it's a, about halfway between here geneva and uh, the winery in dundee mm-hmm and I had it farmed organically for a few years, yep. uh, the Martins. And then when we installed the drain tile. I, I just want to say, what a, a local treasure. Oh, my gosh. He is. <laughs> Unbelievable. And Peter's yep. doing a great job carrying that legacy forward. If, yep. uh, if you're listening or watching this and haven't had a chance to see Chef's Table on Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, they have a, an episode where they feature Klaus Martin. Sure. Yeah. Uh, showing, uh, is it Blue Hill? that a lot of his organic oh, produce. I don't know, to. but you know, I've gotten more familiar with him from listening to other national podcasts where yeah. he's like, he's a star. He's an international he star and he's our neighbor right here. Yep. Uh, so we farmed it. And then when we put the drain tile in, you know, 300 million year old shale was now on the surface. <laughs> yeah. And whether kind of right before planting, doing a lot of other things, it took us a lot longer because we were obsessed Pulling fossils, I'm looking at this unbelievable <laughs> fossils, uh, trilobites, yep. uh, you know, brachiopods, you name it. Yeah. And the coolest thing, you know, just sort of, sort of the the novice rock hounder, you know, yeah. uh, geologically interested, uh, was when you would pull out some of these, where because of the way the shale was deposited yep. in that era. You know, it was building layer upon layer and often anaerobic, so no oxygen. Yep. So these shells hadn't even decomposed. That's so cool. I mean, that <laughs> just blows the mind. Yep. The other thing it does is it helps you realize your place as a steward yeah. here. Yep. Um, so let's discuss that because un I, I had appreciated soil, but yep. I have to be honest, before taking the courses that, that you help manage, I wouldn't have known the difference between dirt and soil. Right. Yeah. And once you start to get that, and once you understand that soil is the medium for life, yep. it changes the way you think about agriculture because it, change, it, it forces you to reconcile that it is also about us. Yeah. Yep. Um, you do a lot to help take care of your soil and, you know, and just how important it is. Mm -hmm. That hinges in part, I think it ties together well, with uh, what could have been a major tragedy for your life in 2018. Oh, geez. So, I mean, so what happened in 2018? We got 11 inches of rain and be, uh, between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. Hmm. And I mean, I think that at the highest point, it was like three and a half inches in an hour. <sighs> and of course, all of the vineyards around here are on a hill yeah. and they tend to be a little bit steeper uh, down by us. And <clears throat> I remember you weren't a student at the time, were you? That wasn't, no, you were already done. Yeah, that. yeah. So uh, I woke up, it was August 14th, it was 6 a.m. And at that time of year, at 6 a.m., the sun is just peeking through. It's not quite sunrise yet, but it's, you know, you've had first light. 
And I remember I made coffee. I fed the cat. But the cat made coffee in that order. <laughs> cat won't let me make coffee if I don't feed it. Um, and then the cat goes out after I make coffee. And I opened the door, and I knew it had been raining. We were expecting yeah. about an inch of rain. And the cat just kind of looked at me. And I'm like, why aren't you going out? And I looked out the door, and the road in front of my house was like a raging river. And I was like, oh, this is different. Yeah. And I quickly realized I've got to cancel class. Yeah. And it was the first, cla- first and only class I've ever canceled just – flat out canceled saying we're not making it up for nothing yeah. and um you know for the you know several weeks it was just clean up uh, because when that much water goes downhill it really guts the land mm-hmm. and i'd never you know we always talk about erosion happening slowly over time okay a little bit of erosion happens slowly over time but what i realized that day was that a lot of erosion happens and individual events Mm. and that was one of those events and changed the landscape wherever there wasn't something holding the dirt down um organic matter in particular uh that dirt went down the hill with the water uh so the traditional method of managing vineyards where you have a clean undervine strip a lot of my neighbors just had gullies under their vines um shellstone ended up uh one of their hedgerows which is where we are headlands i should say which is where you turn the tractor around at the end of the row so you can drive down the other row a lot of people forget that we've got to be able to drive a tractor (laughs) um he had just a gully going down he couldn't get a tractor in or out of the vineyard until he brought in material to fill that in afterwards and i know in 2019 um at least two of my neighbors if not more were replacing debris in the middle of the vineyard and I, there was an observation I made that day. Uh, we had a gravel pile mm-hmm. on August 13th, 20, 2018, and we had a, um, a wood chip pile. They're really pretty much right next to each other. Mm. Uh, on August 14th of 2018, there was no gravel pile. Wow. The gravel pile was in the lake for all practical purposes. The wood chip pile was still there. Hmm. And it says a lot for what organic matter is capable of doing in extreme events. Mm -hmm. And in my vineyard, we had undervine cover crop that was completely, you know, growing underneath the vines. We didn't lose any soil. We were picking up a lot of gravel. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For weeks, we were picking up gravel, uh, but we didn't lose the soil where we needed the soil. Mm. Uh, And it was just fascinating to me, just that, you know, it. You go through life and then you have cer- certain things happen where, you know, it changes how you think about things. And that was one of those times where my whole outlook, like I got lucky because I had already done something that was good. But now I realize just how important it is to keep that land covered. And when I drive by a field in the wintertime that is just brown, mm. I just, you know, brown with dirt, not brown with like dead vegetation, it really bothers me now because i i now understand how important it is to have living roots in the ground to preserve that soil and to and to continue to build that soil because when we don't have organic matter growing we're not you know building that soil back up so you know as farming in general and viticulture is just a small part of the greater agricultural community we have to focus really on regenerating what the previous couple of generations have really burned up out of the soil Mm -hmm. and um soil is a living breathing thing we anything that is in the soil eventually ends up in us you know and it's the way the earth is really alive um and we have to be able to really you know this generation of farming starting with us we've really got to say how do we want to be remembered do we want to be remembered for continuing to burn up the carbon that's in the soil or do we want to replace some of that carbon that's been burned up um another uh time i was digging a drain tile i was trying to get a wet spot out of the vineyard and i remember i started in the hedgerow where the trees are and stuff just beyond the headlands and um I started digging there, and the soil was dark brown and black, and there was all this life in it. And then I continued to dig with my backhoe into the vineyard. And by the time I got into the you know edge of the vineyard, the soil was light brown, 
mm. and just lacked any of that vigor. And, you know, a silver thread, there's been vineyard there for 150 years yep. and it's been farmed for that long and it's lost a lot of that organic matter and that's not good. No. And so like, okay, I've realized that. So what am I going to do now? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's keeping things growing. It's adding organic matter back. Um, so it's, to me, it's a challenge, but it's really exciting. And I, I'm really looking forward to the next, you know, several years of, um, helping people understand this and really going forward with what do we do? Right. Like, how do we change what we've been doing? How do we move away from the glyphosate cl culture and move into something else and still maintain our productivity and the awesome wines that we make. Exactly. So people don't necessarily know it takes a hundred thousand years to build an inch of soil naturally. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's why I always encourage folks. It, it sounds small, but simple things like not throwing out your food scraps or when you're cutting vegetables, yep. uh, just keep a bucket by yep. the back door, mm -hmm. you know, little things like that, that you can do in your own home actually does make a difference sure it does yeah. in the large swath we've talked about 76 being an, an important date i do agree with you i think it it, it all sort of happened and maybe it's because we talked to each other but between like 2013 and 2016 there was a real awakening that seemed to happen in the finger lakes mm -hmm. um i know growers that i had worked with a, a lot of them stopped using glyphosate mm -hmm. um you know there was a big investment in there's a tool that folks can put on their vineyard called a brawn, where mm -hmm. if they do want some weed control and they don't have uh, under vine kind of cover crops, yep. they can just get them down that way. Yeah. Keep them out of the canopy. Uh, what do you think that's what it was? Is it just the camaraderie of Finger Lakes producers talking and learning? Uh, what do you think led to that? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting as somebody who's been, who, who's gone for, you know, Purchasing a vineyard that was, you know, being farmed exclusively by tilling under the vine with, with the brawn, actually, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, stop tilling and using herbicides and now totally different direction where I've had an undervine cover crop since, you know, starting to establish that in 2016. Um, there is changes happening. And I think it's a combination, you know, people don't. You know, people, farmers don't want to spray, don't want to use mm -hmm. material because it costs money. And uh, just having a lighter impact and finding a more efficient way to do it could be it. Uh, I think that, you know, for the changes we might have seen back then, we're going to see a lot more changes in the coming years. Um, looking at a sustainability certification for the entire New York State industry, mm -hmm. what that's going to look like and where that might um, hopefully drive some people to go, you know, I, I don't really want to comment on it cause we don't know what it's going to look like yeah. quite yet. We know it's going to be va based on vine balance, but, um, are, is glyphosate con con going to continue to be a tool for some growers? Probably, uh, you know, there, there's some, you know, there's some aspects of it and, you know, large commercial growers who are growing, uh, juice grapes, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good tool. Uh, but for somebody like us, we were growing wine grapes. We need to get away from that. Um, and we can't force anybody to do it. We've got to let people do it through education, really. Yeah. Uh, they've got to they've got to want to do it. Um, so we'll see. You know, there, there's there's ways to regulate around things, but I don't think our politicians want to regulate glyphosate out of the equation quite yet yeah and quite frankly with the level of lobbying that happens from a lot of those chemical producers i don't think we'd ever see that happen nope <laughs> um, unfortunately and that's why it does become kind of a an evangelizing of yeah. the benefits and particularly as you mentioned we're not just making juice we're yeah. making wine and yeah. you can taste the difference between properly farmed fruit mm -hmm. and kind of what what we would say now is conventionally farmed, even though that window of conventional farming is really probably only about 50 years mm -hmm. because what we're doing is nothing new. We're simply rediscovering 
what the teachers and the farmers of former generations had done. Yeah, well, we had to grow uh, food for people and grow wine uh, for thousands of years, millions of years before we ever got to this point of the agri- agrochemical revolution. Um, but think about it this way, you know, going back to the soil, what is actually going on in the soil? And, you know, we've got these microorganisms down there, uh, bacteria, fungi, mm-hmm. other things, uh, and they're, you know, there's more of them in a handful of soil than there are people on the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all, there's a huge diversity of species and they all serve a, a place. Now, as soon as we put any kind of chemical in the field, it changes how those organisms interact with each other. It changes which ones are dominating. Um, and when we start burning up uh, carbon resources in the soil, that also changes everything. And how do we burn up carbon resources? Well, we put fertilizer out and the uh, or- microorganisms use the carbon to, you know, use the fertilizer to chew on the carbon. Uh, we think that we put the fertilizer out for the plants, but really we're putting it on that, those microorganisms. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really complicated system. And the more that we respect what is actually going on under the ground, um, now, grapevines are unique that they don't have root hairs. You know, people mm-hmm. are taught in school, you know, roots have root hairs, grapevines don't. And, you know, the root hairs are the surface area to absorb everything. Well, if grapevines don't have root hairs and they don't have many roots, period, how are they absorbing stuff? Well, it's the microorganisms that are helping them absorb everything. So if we're messing with the microorganisms, then we're messing with what the grapevines uptake. And when you take out the, and, you know, I, I say this, but I don't really understand quite yet, like, what the implications are, but I know there are implications because mm-hmm. I can see it myself. Uh, but when you take out the, the impact on the microorganisms and you let them be, now mycorrhizal fungi can have hundreds of miles of reach yeah. if they're undisturbed, and they can take stuff from far away and bring it to that vine if the vine needs it. And then what, what does the, uh, the fungi get in return? It gets sugar. That's right. the, the vine gives it food. Um, so there's a give and take between the plants and the soil. And, you know, when the soil is properly taken care of, I think that that, that exchange becomes much richer and it becomes a much more expressive um, uh, representation the wine can become a more expressive representation of what that site is really capable of Mm -hmm. um so it's it's going to be interesting to see where we're going with that um as we start respecting the soil a little bit more and building that back up definitely i stumbled upon i i do a lot of home gardening sure and uh i've never grown sweet potatoes so i was interested in trying some sweet potatoes this year i stumbled upon a guy who has a youtube channel uh, thing called David the Good. Sure. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes a little bit to what we can learn from some of these really great but smaller scale home gardeners. He was mm-hmm. talking a lot about fungi and how he puts oatmeal in mm-hmm. his soil. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I imagine that's it's the breakdown of those carbohydrates into sugars that really helps them grow. So I am excited because I do think there's this whole world of stuff for yep. us to learn. Yeah. Um, and I like your approach what was that ter- is that a term you came up with paul or what's that the not it's not biodynamic it's bio regenerative or the bio intensive yeah yeah so i started working with a, a friend of mine i'll, I'll just tell mike Bilton's story um I, i'm a i'm a triathlete mm-hmm. i started about 10 years a little bit over 10 years you're, ago you're in better shape than me so <laughs> yeah, well i haven't swam since the pandemic so i feel a little funny because of because of that. But uh, it was actually in the pool back in 2010, 2011, I'd be swimming and I'm a social guy. I'll yeah. talk to anybody. I don't care if we're halfway clothed. <laughs> and uh, Mike would be swimming in the morning. You know, we're talking 5 a.m. And we got talking and, you know, we'd, we'd work out together and we, we'd be talking. And it turns out he was, uh, the, at the time, the orchard manager at Red Jacket Orchards. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he found out that I own Silver Thread, and he's he's an orchard guy. He's got a master's of science from Cornell, just like me. And and so we kind of hit it off, and we had a lot in common. And, you know, he's always been interested in organic and uh, biodynamic. And it was really – it took him five, six years to really um, kind of 
get into my head enough to to help me, you know, down this pathway. And what we really decided to call it was biointensive. Now, biointensive is actually a term that's used. It's uh, I think there's a group. It's out west somewhere, either mm. California, or Oregon, but um, and they're more really focused on um, home gardening, uh, gardening, so you can produce food on a small scale. Mm-hmm. So, like for you know, helping uh, a village in Africa or something, yep. trying to be self self sufficient um, instead of having to re- rely on food being brought in, and using all of the resources on the farm and and stuff like that, and not using chem- chemical inputs, you mm-hmm. know, just using biological inputs and what that looks like. And so we kind of adopted that term biointensive um, for what we were doing and really just looking at how do we use the uh, biology of the ecosystem and other biology that we could bring in. So instead of spraying, okay, so we've got five main pathogens that attack our grapevines mm-hmm. that we really have to manage. If we don't manage them, we lose our crop pretty much any year yep. in the Finger Lakes. Um, and so what do we use? Well, we use chemicals to manage those. Even if you're an organic farmer, you're yeah. using some kind of chemical to manage those. So instead of using a chemical that's been um, produced at a chemical factory, uh, using a chemical uh, that's bio- biologically produced. Mm-hmm. So is, is that a fermentation byproduct? Is that a plant extract? Uh, is that some kind of tea that you can make yourself? Or, uh, is it commercially available? Is it a live organism that you can populate the um, ecosystem that exists on the leaves and on the grapevines that mm-hmm. would then outcompete or kill uh, the other, uh, the pathogens that you're trying to, um, you know, control? And, and you know, going down this path, um, you know, stopping spraying herbicides and using biological materials is really a different mindset in how we farm. Mm-hmm. And uh, my my favorite analogy was that, uh, you know, farmers always wake up every day saying, oh, what can I go kill today? <laughs> and like, none of us are farming because we want to kill stuff. We want things to live. Yeah. And like, we want, uh, you know, Really, what we should be wanting is a diverse ecosystem so that our plants that we we are relying on to grow actually survive um and and prosper and and so that that change in mindset of what how can I go kill everything to how can I make things live and and promote more life that's going to work with me has really been a game changer for me because mm-hmm. because I never think of. The, the chemicals we have to apply as, you know, killing stuff. I'm thinking, what are the most efficient things I can find? Yeah. Biological materials. And when I can't find biological materials, you know, my, my next step would be organic chemicals. So, like, copper and sulfur mm-hmm. are, you know, organic. But, yeah, they're chemicals. <laughs> um, and how do we, we do that? And then the last, if I need to use, um, you know, a modern day chemical you know what is the most efficient one that's going to be most targeted and have the least impact on the bees and Mm -hmm. the other you know on on my soil um and kind of that's where i'm going down the path of how do i manage these things because you know we've got to be honest with ourselves we are farming something that doesn't belong here Mm -hmm. and because we're farming something that doesn't belong here we have to manage it and how do we do that in a way that we're doing the best for the environment so you know, and copper sulfate um, used heavily in organic uh, production for things like powdery mildew, downy mildew. Yeah. Do you have any concerns that all of this use of copper is going to ultimately harm our water tables and hurt us in ways we aren't contemplating now? Yeah. So I uh, was under the assumption when I bought Silver Thread that uh, Richard was using copper sulfate. And why was I under that assumption? I should have just asked him because I found bags of it, right, mm. that were in the barn. And so I knew he was using it at one point. Uh, but I was interested to find uh, that he, when I found his notes, he wasn't actually using copper sulfate. Mm. Um, he was using uh, other forms of copper. He had stopped using copper sulfate. He still had the bag. And it was dirt cheap. The stuff yeah. is, like, ridiculously cheap. So... 
Uh, but it takes a lot to be effective at the yep. control measures that we need. Uh, so there are uh, so copper sulfate and okay, I'm a chemical engineer, so I'm going to geek out a little <laughs> bit here. Uh, Do it. <laughs> it's a it's a plus two form of uh, uh, cation of copper, and there's other forms of copper uh, that can be more effective. Uh, so there's there's a product out there that's actually a fatty acid of copper. Uh, that is uh, more effective at disease control, uh, and you need much less metallic copper mm. input in order to uh, have the control. Uh, and then there's other products like um, hydroxides of copper mm -hmm. that are also very effective uh, with much lower metallic copper inputs. So... I didn't really understand that because I, I had a, a mental block for years just saying copper is bad, not going to spray copper, can't use copper. Um, but it turns out that copper is not so bad if you use it responsibly. And I don't know, Europe is kind of going in the direction of copper is bad, we've got to get rid of it all. And from the standpoint where they came from with their vineyard management where the, some producers were dumping 50 pounds of metallic copper on their vineyard wow. year after year for hundreds of years and literally killing that soil because of the copper poisoning. Um, copper is bad, right? Yeah. That, that means copper is bad. Uh, well, when you're using it responsibly and the direction that Europe has gone is they've gone, you know, at one point they said, okay, you can only put 20 pounds of metallic copper. And now you can only put, I think it's like four pounds of metallic mm. copper. I don't know exactly, but they're going down to even less than that. And then they might phase it out. I think they're supposed to phase it out, but it's still controversial because so many people rely on it. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of looking at that as a model. And also different soils treat copper differently. So it turns out that uh, silt loam soils that are very common here in the Finger Lakes mm -hmm. are very um, resilient to copper inputs. So mm -hmm. if you put a little bit of copper out every year and use that as a tool versus using it as the only effective thing that you have, which is what copper sulfate was used as, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that you, there is a responsible way to use copper that it's not going to be building up in the soil, especially if you have a rich uh, biodiverse ecosystem within the soil, mm -hmm. then your soils are much more diverse. So the more higher organic matter that you have in the soil, the, the more resilient those soils would be uh, to copper. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a responsibility on one end, you know, that we have, that we have to the soil, but it's also, you know, how can we use these things? How can we use our tools and think about our tools that, um, where the impacts are and, and mitigating while still doing good. Yep. Um, so I've been using a little bit of copper each year and I measure the amount of metallic copper and I've been around a pound, pound and a half. Yeah. For the past past few years. And, and, you know, going back to that European example where people were putting on 40, 50 pounds of copper, that's a lot. And that's that's irresponsible. Uh, so I would never I, I haven't used copper sulfate. I probably won't ever use copper sulfate. Uh, and what I did say before was copper sulfur. And because sulfur is the other yeah. and when I say copper, I'm saying metallic copper in any form and sulfur. <clears throat> the element S, sulfur, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very effective fungicide against things like powdery mildew. Uh, and it's organic, mm -hmm. and it's widely used even in conventional agriculture, and it's still a, it's a useful tool. It is. It uh, is. It's effective at what it does, and it's inexpensive too. So, You know, in talk of, talking about this idea, just to stay on farming for a little bit longer, mm -hmm. um, our responsibility to keeping soil in place uh, what gets used for folks who don't know. I mean, as you, and you, you mentioned it earlier, a lot of our vineyards are on slopes. Yep. Those slopes slope right down to the lake. And a lot of people get their drinking water from the lake. Uh, they are extremely rich in fish life. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've seen an increasing problem with algae blooms in the shallower lakes, mm -hmm. uh, largely from excessive phosphorus use. Mm -hmm. But this is something that it, it's not, it, it, I mean, not to put it selfishly, it's not just about stewardship. It's about the lives that are impacted in small communities here today. Yeah. Um, every, anything that happens on the slope eventually makes its way down to the lake. Um, 
I've talked to my soil and waters guy. Yeah, you know, I I gen- generally tend not to dig a hole at Silver Thread without talking to my yeah soil and water guy at the county, and he just makes me feel better. You know, he he's generally of the approach of you can do whatever you want. You're the farmer. Um, I'm just here to make sure you don't ruin the stuff. <laughs> uh, but his biggest complaints are the dairy farmers where their cows are in the streams. He's mm-hmm. like, we've got to fix that. Yeah, you know, because those streams where the cows are, they're they're defecating in the streams and they're ending up right in the lake. And that's a tremendous amount of nutrient load on the lakes. And so that's number one, probably the biggest agricultural problem we have. And I hate the, it's a certain segment of the population. It's not every dairy farmer, Mm -hmm. uh, but dairy farmers should have their streams walled off, you know, fenced off for their herds. Um, Number two, we've got to be cognizant that anything we're putting out there is going to slowly filter through or quickly go down in case of a, a, deluge and i'm really you know i'm learning right we're all learning we have have to keep learning you and i are both lifelong learners you know what does that look like what is my responsibility okay so i've got a pesticide i want to use i've got to follow the label that's number one you Mm -hmm. know don't spray it within a hundred feet of a water body and and following those rules um and then making sure you know having Again, it goes back to resiliency in the soil, the soil that has life in it, it has more organic matter in it, has roots growing in it, is going to be able to um, digest any input that you put on the land more efficiently, so it's not going to make it into the lake. Um, you know, if it does make it in the lake, it's you know been decomposed and it's a, it's a small byproduct that's not really an effective thing anymore. So it's We've got to be conscious of that, and we've got to keep learning. I'm always looking at, you know, I think on Wednesday I'm participating in, in something with um, Seneca and Cuga Lake Watershed folks, uh, mm-hmm. and, and just always looking, like, what can I do and how can I do it better? Yeah. Um, and never being complacent in what I'm doing is the best thing. I, I would never joke with myself that, I'm doing the best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have so much to learn. Yes. Yep. And speaking of so much to learn, um, we have seen people have called it global weirding, uh-huh. uh, changes in weather patterns. Uh, I, heard, I heard you mention uh, an anecdote recently about the eclipse and sure. what that may have meant <laughs> uh, for farming. We actually, maybe we don't know, uh, but I'd love if you could share that. Well, I just, you know, I remember every year, I remember the weather we experienced, and ever since I got into farming, you know, it's been very apparent to me that the weather affects everything that happens, including what goes into the bottle of wine every year. So it's really important to me to understand different weather events. Now, I've used the eclipse just as a timestamp to make people remember 2017 and where you were when the solar eclipse happened because everybody watched the solar (laughs) eclipse, right? So it's really easy timestamp that everybody can go, oh, I remember that versus the flood of 2018. Nobody really remembers what they're doing, you know, on August 14th, 2018, but everybody remembers what they're doing when that eclipse happened in North America. And what happened after that is a a story that I need people to know. It was really warm. It was really sunny. It was beautiful summer up to that point in 2017 and then it got like a day or two after the eclipse it got really cold we had frosts in the adirondacks Mm -hmm. um and it stayed cold and it really delayed the ripening for Mm -hmm. 2017 and right into almost the second week of september it wasn't looking good now we were coming off of 2016 which is a sunny dry year and we had more crop out than anybody had realized up to that point and when we have a lot of crop out there we have to ripen that crop which means more work for the vines and when it's cold the vines aren't doing any work and i remember those last two weeks of august it was like high of 65 and coal, you know, into the 40s at night. And it was like, vines aren't doing anything. Bricks and weren't moving on. on nothing was on moving. Grape. I remember yeah. the start of the semester going, yeah, we're going to make wine this year. I don't know when. Yeah. This is kind of an odd, odd thing that's going on right now. And then, uh, and then second week of September towards the end, it just got beautiful. Set, you know, highs in the 70s and 80s, lows at night in the maybe mid 50s or upper 60s. And everything just started moving. 
and we had you know it was in 80 degrees in October. We some some Octobers we never see 70 degrees, <laughs> and we yeah. had like stretches of 80 degree weather, and it was just ended up being a glorious harvest. But there was a point, you know, for those two three weeks in late August September, like it could have been disaster. Yeah. Like we could have been harvesting things at like 17 bricks, <laughs> which generally we'd like at least 20 bricks. 22 is really awesome. Um, and, and, and that's the sugar level that's in the grapes at harvest. And like, we'd like the acids to be, oh, the Riesling under eight and a half, eight. Um, and we needed to be warm and sunny to achieve those two things. And in 2017, we weren't getting there. And then we, we got lucky. And, you know, that's a beautiful thing about, Beautiful, beautiful thing uh, about the Finger Lakes is that most years we get lucky, yeah. it, whether it be early in the season or late in the season. Um, it's knocking on wood. Um, so, but we live in a climate that's challenging and it makes it really rewarding to do what we do every year. And, you know, you and I don't know what the reward of 2021 is going to be right now. But I know in a year we're going to be talking about something that happened in 2021 that, you know, by the skin of our teeth, we got a crop and we made wine and it was awesome. Um, and it really does depend. <laughs> I mean, there are years where, you know, the snow is coming. It, it's 70 degrees, but it's going to snow in two days, two feet. Yep. And you've got to bring crop in. Yeah. Uh, you're right. There's always something, whether it be a plague of some sort of pest, yep. <laughs> <laughs> which seems it's different every year, uh, or the weather. Um, you know, the thing that I do love about the Finger Lakes is our diversity mm -hmm. of varietals and styles. So, yeah. you know, years that are cooler, we just make a little more sparkling wine and yeah. <laughs> you know, other, other years we focus on some of those Bordeaux reds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is something. And then with regard to climate change, yeah, how do you think this is going to impact us? Well, what always makes me feel better about climate change is that we're in the Finger Lakes and that we're already coming from a challenging situation. Yes, we've endured more extremes in the past decade than you know our previous generation probably had to do their entire uh, farming time. But We've been enduring challenging conditions here, and it's been a mindset um, from one grape grower to the next and one winemaker to the next to know uh, the tools that you need to be successful mm -hmm. in those challenging circumstances. And now that we're going to have more extremes and different extremes, I know we'll be able to deal with it yeah. as long as we can grow a crop, you know, and that's, and that's the big if, you know, as long as we can, you know, hang fruit on the vines and ripen the vines, we'll be able to make really good wine because we've been resilient in the past. We understand how to be resilient and I don't see any reason why we're going to lose the toolbox that we've, you know, spent generations building here in the Finger Lakes. And I think that's really the, the thing that I like to, to, to hang my hat on and you know we've never been able to know that oh it's going to be a dry year because we live in a certain place that's always dry yeah. we don't know that but we know how to deal with wet years we know how to deal with cold years we know how to deal with warm years we know how to deal with dry years it's we've done it yeah. and we'll figure it out yeah. Yeah. there there does seem to be one pass from the horizon that has everybody nervous the spotted uh, lantern fly. That's right. <laughs> Cue the, the, the scary music. Yes, yes. Uh, and I'm throwing a picture up. So sure, if anybody great. sees one. Yeah, <laughs> we'll contact. throw all of the pictures of all the generations. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's going to be up here. Um, but let's recap that. What we're facing, where it is right now. And I know they did find uh, some yeah. in Ithaca. Yep. And even up, did they find one in Geneva? I I heard that yeah, but it was an isolated incident maybe okay. just like one one adult. Where down in Ithaca, they actually found egg masses. So make sure you throw mm. up the picture of the egg masses too. Um, everybody should be, everybody across the country should yeah. understand what this pest looks like. Uh, so the spotted lanternfly, and I've done a lot of, um, I kind of weaseled my way into the invasive people of New York State just sat in some of their meetings to see how they're talking about this pest and uh, understand what's being done about it. And really so far, 
the management of the spotted lanternfly. So it, it showed up in the Pennsylvania area, Lancaster area, uh, about six, seven years ago. And they, they're they pretty sure it had been here for two or three years before that. And I hope I'm getting this right. If anybody uh, who's really in on, on it uh, know, uh, is listening. But uh, so it's it's around, it's present before you really see it. Uh, it takes uh, you know a few generations. Uh, but it is an insect that has one adult generation a year. It overwinters as egg masses. Uh, then it goes through several successive um, nymph generations every year, and then it usually adults sometime uh, late summer. Mm. Uh, so during harvest time uh, yeah. is when the adults are around. And what they do is they attach their, the, themselves to perennial plants like vines and other trees, uh, and they suck the phloem out of it, and it mm. basically goes right through them, and it comes mm. right out. Uh, so... They because vines, you know, are not as big as a oak tree, um, or not very big at all compared to that. They don't have a lot of mass when all of their sugars are being sucked out by the, you know, what the spotted lanternfly does. It swarms onto the vine, uh, and it usually picks like one or two vines and it'll swarm onto that and suck the life out of it, and then they'll move on to the next one. Um, and and you'll see if you see these videos online, they're just covered and this will be their harvest and this this um uh the honeydew coming out their back end uh gets all over the grapes mm-hmm. turns out that that's not uh the the worst thing uh but it's not anything it's desirable gross. it's gross <laughs> yeah and it, it promotes you know other mildews and yeah. stuff like that it's disgusting uh so we've got this this pest you know so it's been contained in Pennsylvania it's spreading um it's likely that we will see it in our vineyards. They're saying probably next year, 2022, we'll see it. We might see mm. some this year. It's not going to be a real problem probably till 2023. And it probably won't be a real problem everywhere. And what I'm really focusing on is making sure that my vines are resilient and healthy and can withstand an onslaught mm. um, if, if one occurs. And it's really kind of scary because we, you know, this, because it's one generation a year, it's really easy to control um, to kill them with insecticides, but nobody wants to be spraying insecticides no. at harvest time. And it's really the adults that are most controllable. Uh, so I, I have my faith in Cornell University, Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, Penn State, uh, and those folks that are really working on it. There's some hope that there's a native, a couple of native fungi mm-hmm. uh, that attack it and maybe weaponizing that fungi. And I hate to use that word when it comes to <laughs> agriculture, but in this case, we want to weaponize it. So this pest is endemic to um, like China and uh kind of goes hand in hand with uh the tree of heaven mm-hmm. um tree of heaven uh atlantis and there's a lot of that here in the Fairbanks. lakes mm-hmm. and so i've been cutting that down as over thread and, you know where we have it and encouraging my neighbors to cut it down yep. we're not certain well we the the experts are not certain if the spotted lantern fly needs the tree of heaven or just prefers the tree of heaven it's it's likely that it just prefers um, but you know, it's something we all need to keep our eye out because it's not just viticulture that's going to be impacted. I mean, it's when you have an insect swarming on the side of your house, yeah. you, you're, you might not be sucking anything out of your house, but you're not going to like that. No. <laughs> um, and that's, that's a reality that people are dealing with down in Pennsylvania and it's not that fun, but apparently, you know, it'll go through a high and then they kind of die off and we don't really understand what's going on with this pest. And we know that in their native habitat, they're not a pest. Mm. It's really just here where they don't have as many natural enemies that they behave like they are. So Mm. it's really interesting. Um, I think that we're going to be able to withstand it somehow. I have no idea how quite yet. Uh, And I'm glad that the people who are uh, running the quarantine are doing such a good job that it's not here yet. Because if nothing was done, it would have been here three, four years ago, and it would have been really bad, and we wouldn't have had any tools, but some good people are on it, and I trust that when it gets here, we'll have some strategy. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be a good strategy, but we'll have a strategy. Well, and it's even more impressive that it has been kept out this long, because when you think about 
where a core group of Finger Lakes visitors are coming from. Yep. That's Pennsylvania. Yeah, right from uh, the heart of it. A, exactly. Yep. I had folks from Lancaster in the tasting room this weekend. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that we've been able to keep it out is in part reliant on the fact that these folks live with this pest down there right now. They know how dangerous it is for us. And they don't want to bring it here. No, yep. no. Yeah. Uh, so I wish it had kind of more negative names attached to it because honeydew, tree <laughs> of heaven, like these are all really like nice lanterns. <laughs> lanterns. Yeah. The worst name associated with it is fly. Nobody likes flies. No, no. It's not really a fly. It's a, oh, it's a sap sucker is what mm. it is. And uh, it's fat. It's a beautiful insect. And it insect. is beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful insect, but it's it's a terrifying devil. And it is something that you know, if you're listening in California right now, I know there are a lot of California growers who are keeping abreast of this yep. because it, it could devastate the entire Apparently country's Apparently it's vehicle. been found there. I mean, like, right. you look at the railroad map, and it loves to lay its egg masses on metal, mm -hmm. like rusty old metal. And you look at the railroad beds, and it goes right through there, straight mm. across the country. I mean, this uh, this thing can show up anywhere. Um, and and we all have to be on the lookout for it. Apparently, I think they have found it in California. And so I— It'll be interesting, yep. you know, because once, you know, if it gets into the grape industry there, then maybe some real research dollars will be thrown at it and we'll weaponize those fungi in <laughs> no time. <laughs> yep. Can we spend a few minutes talking about some of your research into nitrogen uh, and fermentation? For fermentation, yeah. So when, when were you a second year student at FLCC, Chris? I think it was 16. Okay. So... It was maybe 2017. I've seen things that you've done. It might have been Bev New York or yeah, and, some other industry. And we, I should say that I'm a sponge when it comes to the research in nitrogen. I've done very little of my own research. I'm a, I'm a practitioner when it comes to both yeah. grape growing and winemaking. And uh, so I've always been very concerned with uh, fermentation nutrition. And it was, I think it was 2017 after harvest, uh, somebody came from. Scott Labs from Lalamond and was talking to my class about all the new research. And this was very new stuff, like within mm -hmm. a couple of years. And it really just threw what I thought I had a really good handle on into, into tatters and really um, looking at how, what a healthy fermentation looks like. We know that nitrogen plays an important part, but so does a lot of other micronutrients and mm -hmm. um, vitamins. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, it's not so simple with just nitrogen. There's organic and inorganic mm -hmm. um, nitrogen and a fermentation. And they both come from the grapes. We can add both forms. And it turns out uh, in the Finger Lakes, uh, when I was at Cornell, I studied with Thomas Hennick Kling. He pu published a paper back in 1990 mm -hmm. showing how deficient our grapes are in the Finger Lakes in nitrogen. And it was a source of one of the, um, well, it was the source of the problems that we were having in the, in the cellar at the time, meaning like there was a lot of stuck fermentations, a lot of fermentations where the yeast just could not finish fermenting. So he identified the problem, low nitrogen. His solution was add as much inorganic nitrogen, uh, which is diammonium phosphate, as possible. Well, we've come a long way from then yeah. <laughs> uh, to the point where I'm managing nitrogen in fermentations, but uh, not using diammonium phosphate at all anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, I mean, I think it's still a good tool, but only when necessary, really. Certain yeast um, like more nitrogen than other yeast, and if you, ha if you match the yeast to the environment that they're in, so if you have a low nitrogen environment, put a yeast in or uh, the native endemic yeast are probably going to be okay with a little bit of nitrogen. So mm -hmm. how do we manage them otherwise and um, make sure that they produce the maximum amount of really good smelling and uh, you know, fruity characteristics that we want to come out of our wines? And it's really about organic nitrogen and you know, knowing how much you have and I, I stress this all the time to, to winemakers, you've got to measure your what's called yeast assimilable nitrogen. Yep. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have a handle on that, you can't manage it. Yeah. It's just like managing your checkbook. If you don't know what your balance is, <laughs> <laughs> you can't really manage that checkbook. Um, so you've got to know how much nitrogen is there. And then you've got to understand the tools that you have on the shelf or not. Um, and 
what either pulling those levers or not pulling those levers, uh, m how might those impact your, your final result? I am a grape grower at heart. I don't want to screw up what I do in the vineyard. Yeah. And that, to me, makes fermentation, uh, nutrition, and uh, understanding the ecosystem that is a fermentation. And it's a short-lived ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Whether it be you know for uh, a week or two or three months, yeah. uh, that's a short-lived ecosystem. And, and we've got to appreciate that we want you know, there's certain health aspects uh, that includes nutrition, that includes temperature, that uh, we can all, again, it goes back to learning more about. And it's the, the amount of research that's been published since 2015, 2016, uh, is just really unknown to a lot of people. And I'd have to say that, uh, just to throw a bone out to Scott Labs, they've done the best job of... Um, disseminating that information and really changing their recommendations over the past uh, two or three years hmm. um, and how they're recommending people manage fermentations for the better. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we can always know more. And that's, that's, it always comes back to that. It's like we can't be complacent in what we're doing because there might be a better way. Yep. And I truly feel like my wines have become more reflective of the vineyard as I've learned how to manage the grapes better as I deliver them to people in the bottle. Yeah. So, so I know we both do things differently yeah. uh, in the cellar uh, and do things differently from kind of the textbook way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But it seems like this kind of the, the traditional method of you've got your yan measurement and then at the start of the ferment, you've got your, your dose of nitrogen and then one third of the way through you, you've got another. Yep. That seems to be changing. That, yeah. So I try and back off, you know, as as long as I have some amount of nitrogen, we try and back off that initial dose at the beginning of fermentation and only, and give as much at one third as possible. Mm. And what that does, so if you give a lot of nitrogen early on in the fermentation, we're really geeking out right here. So <laughs> <laughs> we're losing people and we got people That's on the fine. edge of their seat at the same time. <laughs> um, when you give the, the fermentation a big dose of nitrogen early on, uh, at the beginning of fermentation, what we're talking about is when the, the sugar is just being consumed uh, in the fermentation. So throw a bunch of nitrogen in then. What happens is the yeast population build up really high and they need more nitrogen later on versus when you um, wait to one-third sugar depletion to give all the organic nitrogen in there. Um, you're actually you're going to have a lower population of yeast that instead of using all of their energy to sustain a higher population, they're going to use that energy more to make aromatic, more beautiful molecules. So it's been a, you know, and, and, that, and if you're inoculating a fermentation, using a rehydration nutrient is still like, it's more important now than ever. Yeah. And, and to do that, it's, a, it's what we have as, winemakers to ensure that we're going to, you know, be able to focus on, you know, focus on the vineyard more than focusing on fixing a line. Exactly. You know, I don't want, I, I don't like fixing lines. I don't like talking to people about fixing lines. And, you know, it, you know, one of my uh, downfalls in life, I, I would say, is that people look at me as, a, you know, a respected winemaker and, and what they don't realize is I don't want to help them fix their <laughs> wines. I want to yeah. help them make better wines. Yep. <laughs> and yep. that really starts with the grapes and being responsible during fermentation so you don't have to mess with the grapes. And, and if you're good to your yeast, your, your wines are going to show it um, because your wines are going to be reflective of the vineyard, not by some intervention that you had to do in the cellar. Exactly. And I think that is the key in both of us. I do some depending on the site, depending on the yep. style we're going for, some totally uninoculated, yep. no nitrogen additions. And there are others where you hold its hand. Yeah. You yep. just want to respect the fruit and you've got a kind of a vision of what that wine will be. Yep. Uh, if, let's talk a little bit about Finger Lakes Community College. So your other hat, a uh, little bit about the program, and then we're going to taste some wine. Sure. When is this going to air, Chris? Uh, this will think? probably air sometime in May or June. Okay. So it, it won't be any surprise that, um, I'm leaving FLCC at the end of August. So this will okay. be kind of more of an, more or less a official announcement. I've been there for 11 years. Um, I, I got to see the viticulture center from, you know, a dream to, yeah. you know, that's where I teach people now. 
and the, the teaching and demonstration vineyard. Uh, and it's just time uh, for me to move on and let somebody else really take that, take everything I've built up and take it in th- uh, a new direction and uh, infuse new energy. Um, but, you know, I, I'm extremely proud. I could do it for my whole life if I didn't have my own vineyard and winery yeah. that I'm so passionate about, you know, so... Yeah. So you you held the hand of this program from its start, which was like closets with carboys. <laughs> Literally. To, yeah. Yep. Uh, to a facility now with, uh, I mean, a number of 30 gallon jacketed temperature controlled tanks, yep. beautiful press pad. I think you finally got a good bottling system there yes, now. Yes. It's beautiful. Uh, so. In in so many ways, I just I wish that bit center was my cellar with bigger tanks. <laughs> I wish it was and my I wish cellar. I had some sometimes. thirty gallon tanks like that too. I mean, it's so flexible, you know. And I have had the the pleasure of using that um, to bottle my wines because uh, we bottle at FLCC once a year. And as an instructor, and bottling is a very complicated mm-hmm. process. I always say, getting grapes is the most important thing to having a good bottle of wine. Getting good grapes. Second most important thing is fermentation. Mm-hmm. Third is bottling. You can yeah. mess all of it up if you don't bottle the right way. So um, I've had to practice, and I've used my own wine to practice at FLCC, and we've actually, because we'd normally be paying other people to help us bottle our wine, we pay FLCC. Uh, when I say we, Silver Thread. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've had the pleasure of using that space with my own wines and my own time without students around, and it's a wonderful place to work within. And uh, I, I think you saying that, I have to agree. It is a great space. And I, on one hand, it's it's been perfect for the students. On one hand, sometimes it's too nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's <laughs> it's too nice in just the minimum amount of way that yeah. it doesn't have frills that you wouldn't expect to find mm-hmm. elsewhere. I mean, it has what you need, but it doesn't have... You don't have a cross flow. Right. There's no cross flow. There's not a centrifuge. Yeah. You still have to hook the hoses up and yep. hook the pumps up and fight over the good pump. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which even happens in my cellar. So. Yes. <laughs> in most cellars. <laughs> uh, folks that are listening can actually get access to some of the wines. I don't yep. know if the school sells it directly. Yeah. So you can contact me at paul.brock at flcc.edu or gina.lee at flcc.edu. She, she'll be there after I leave. Um, but she really, Gina, yeah. makes the wine sales happen. But if you guys are interested in some student-made wines, it's all exceptional. Uh, we are a commercial winery. It's $15 a bottle. doesn't matter what the style is. Uh, it's just the easiest way for us to do it. And all the funds go back into the program in some way or another. Yep. And a plug for a liquor store in Geneva. Padula's has yes. some on the shelf, too. Yep. yep. I think it's neat. And I actually do try, whenever I travel uh, or whenever I'm looking for stuff, I actually seek out a bottle or two of student wines and mm. co-op wines. Sure. To give me a sense for, you know, where the baseline is in a lot of cases for a region. And they are. They're they're delicious. Yeah. I appreciate, uh, you know, I've shared this with you, but I particularly appreciate this idea of trade schools, of sure. two-year schools. Because, you know, masters and law degrees are not for everybody. In fact, mm-hmm. I encourage some folks, don't even think about it. <laughs> but, you know, these two-year programs, and whether it be to learn to be a plumber, an electrician, or a winemaker, yeah. offer this incredible opportunity to have a short time investment, work with leaders in that industry, and it's a relatively small cost outlay yeah. to get a skill that you'll carry with you your whole life. Yeah, it's um, it's incredible. It's not expensive. Like yeah. it's it's affordable. You get access to good. Um, equipment. And I mean, there's so much government funding behind these two-year programs. Uh, It's there for the people. It's there for everybody so that the community benefits from it. There's a reason why uh, these programs exist. And, And we're very lucky. I mean, I've been lucky to be part of FLCC from, you know, the, the program existed for a year before I got there. Uh, but to really kind of mold the direction that it goes in. But there's so many other programs in nursing or um, biotechnology or, you know, just all sorts of things that 
are hands on that give people an education then let them go out in the world and make a living. Yep. And, and that's what I love. It, 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 a lot of folks get stuck 24 and they are in debt mm-hmm. and it sets back the idea of being able to start a family. Yeah. But they can start that a little earlier. Yep. I and wish it, I would have. I, I was way too old when I had my first child. <laughs> I always like to encourage uh, people of the right. And we get people of all ages right out of high yeah. school to people like you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> were, you know, at the time, I believe you could practice in front of the Supreme Court yeah. or got that uh, honor <laughs> while you were a student, I think, um, having nothing to do with being a student <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so it, it's we get everybody. We've had people with PhDs before. And, and it's, it's really cool uh, when somebody comes in and goes, I don't, I'm not tied down. I would like to see as much of the, this wine world as possible. And then we have people going to Australia and New Zealand. And yep. it's really neat uh, to have people out there. And I always get the same feedback. And they come back and they say, I was more prepared yeah. than the people from Davis or from Cornell or from Geisenheim or whatever that they were working with at these other um, internships yeah. and, and harvest. And, and I, I'm always, I'm proud of that. And at the same time, I'm like, damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> and you know, I'm going to do one other kind of small plug on that. Um, I had already owned the winery for five, six years. Uh, I did. I learned a lot, uh, particularly in the areas of kind of sciences. Sure. Uh, I didn't yep. have that. And so even if you're in the position as a winemaker yep. or you're new to it, or you're an owner, I think it's great. And then you also get a chance to see the quality of the education that the people sure. you should be hiring yes. in that uh, program will bring to you. <laughs> I w- I'm really excited to have one of your, your assistant, Matt, yeah, uh, yeah. right now as a student. So he's a great guy. So I love the new label, this Thank feather. You. And yeah. I have to tell you, when I opened the bottle, uh, it perfume jumped right out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it yeah. smells amazing. So we're going to be tasting the 2020 Silver Thread Dry Riesling. Sure. And uh, why don't Let's you... Do <laughs> Tell us a little about a bit about this. So this is a, a very new wine. We actually bottled this in January, and it's a quick turnaround time for a, a wine. Um, and I, w- I would give you all sorts of romantic reasons why I chose it, but I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, speaking of Padula's, yeah. I'd forgotten to grab a, a bottle, and I was up in Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I hope Padula has one of the new labels, and this is the one with the new label they had, which I'm really excited because when I was thinking about what wine I was going to bring, I was like, I should bring the dry Riesling because – this is what the Finger Lakes is about. This is like this is what we're known internationally for. And I yeah. think in, in coming years, we're going to be known more for all of our other varieties and our obscure local varieties and yeah. whatever you want to call them. But it's this is driver. This is what has helped put Finger Lakes on the map as a world class nice. wine producer. And this is a representation of uh, three different lakes. We've got grapes in here from Cuca Lake. From Cuba Lake and from our own vineyard, uh, from two different vineyards on Seneca Lake. Um, so to me, this is the epitome of what a dry Riesling is. Now, it's mostly from my own vineyard. Uh, it's about, um, well, it's a plurality from my own vineyard. It's like 45 or 50% from my own vineyard. And then some from the Doyle Vineyard, which is actually the oldest commercial Riesling vineyard on Seneca Lake, which is mm. just like 100 yards from my vines. Um, it was a vineyard planted by Charles Fournier. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, what's in this bottle really represents the history and the future of the Finger Lakes. So I, I love showcasing dry Riesling wherever I go. I'm with you. Uh, so Charles Fournier had been the head winemaker at Veuve Clicquot before coming here post-prohibition. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I absolutely love about dry Riesling is it showcases the vintage mm-hmm. really well. And and kind of just piggybacking on that, it your wine's tend to show really well mm-hmm. the further down the road they get. I right. opened a 2013 dry Riesling, which wasn't a great vintage, no. but it was tasting amazing. Yeah. Um, that, you know, 2013 was one of those challenging years after a beautiful year. 12, 2012 was the warmest, one of the driest, longest growing seasons. Mm-hmm. Was the warmest we've ever had. Um, was the longest we've ever had. And because it was warm, sunny, long the buds were well developed going into 13 and there's this huge crop out there and then we got this really crappy warm cloudy humid weather that made Mm -hmm. it really challenging uh to grow the grapes uh but with work at it and and we were we were successful and it's like i've got 
high standards every year. The grapes that come into the winery have to be clean. And if they're not, then we have to do the work to make them clean. And uh, some years are easier than others. 2020, easy. easy. <laughs> <laughs> All the grapes were beautiful. Yeah. Um, you, had to, you had to do very minimal management in 2020. You, didn't, you couldn't do nothing. I saw Actually, <laughs> I saw one of our neighbors did nothing and had no Riesling in one vineyard. And it was sad to see that. Like It was yeah. wiped out in such a beautiful year. But it just goes to show, no matter how good it is, you're just one bad decision away from disaster, yep. which is every other year. But 2020 was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and all you do is very minimum, and uh, the fruit was great, and it was a real pleasure to make wine in last year. Uh, given It's a bright spot given all the other stuff that went what on in 2020. What a terrible year it was otherwise. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing that strikes me is the, I mean, the concentration on this. It really is. I haven't tasted that many other 2020 Rieslings from other mm-hmm. producers yet. Yep. Um, but it's beautiful. The acidity is bright and sharp. Hints at that kind of lemon peel. But the palate weight and the stone fruit is really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, just, again, I like to learn about my wines as they age. You know, mm-hmm. I know about the vintage. And I always tell the story of a wine through the vintage. And I expect there to be a lot of concentration in the 2020s. Yeah. And it should be, you know, for Riesling all the way through should be really good. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know that 2020 is going to be one of those years that ages forever. I mean, yeah, seven, eight years down the line, it's going to be beautiful. But yeah. uh, it's not going to be like a cool vintage yeah. uh, that age much longer and retain their youthful characteristics for longer. I think that the 2020s are going to be beautiful uh, early on over the first five years of its, of their lives. Um, and probably more beautiful than, than the cooler vintages ever will be, but the cooler vintages are the ones that last the they longer. Last so yeah. And, and so I'm really excited about the 2020s coming into 2021 for all you people who are coming to the finger lakes. I mean, you're going to be in for a treat with all these wines that are from 2020 and that actually for the next several years, cause yep. it was such a beautiful growing season. And, we had that opportunity to have wines made for us for all practical purposes. You know, we just had to stay out of the way <laughs> and get these grapes into bottle. And the, the uh, one year when we had the most time to do stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's rewarding. Um, whenever you drink your own wine, especially yeah. in public, you know, of course we drink our own wines at home all the time, but not, Hopefully not too much because yep. we, we have to be exploring other people's minds. But it's nice, you know, bringing a bottle to you and sharing it with you and hearing yeah. what, what, how you're experiencing it. Is, it. I appreciate that. No, it's, it's fantastic. The whole lineup is uh, you're one of the few that consistently makes great Pinot Noir. Mm. Uh, so nice work. I appreciate it, Paul. Thanks, man. That's one of my, my uh, only regrets in winemaking is that in 2020 I didn't make a Pinot Noir. Okay. Because it was such a beautiful year. I knew it was the best red Pinot Noir year I'll probably ever see. Yeah. And we didn't have enough grapes. Oh. <laughs> we, we put it all into rosé. And my wife said, listen, we get all the money for rosé by next September. Pinot, it's two years down the road. We've got to make the rosé. And I said, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, the rosé is beautiful. Yeah, I imagine <laughs> it is. Pick, is that at Padula's? Uh, no, not yet. I didn't notice it there. All so, right. but okay. uh, yeah, we have it at the winery. <laughs> I'll, I'll send some across the lake to you and uh, <laughs> a drone or something. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, it would take me about 45 minutes to drive from my winery to your winery. Yes. Yet I can see yours outside the window. It's just on the other side of the lake. Yep. So. Yep. We get there faster in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate cool. you joining us, Paul. I appreciate you asking me, Chris. This has uh, been a lot of fun to chat, and uh, thanks. Yep. Thank you. So Paul Brock is doing amazing things in the Finger Lakes, touching lives, teaching, and he's seeking balance, and he has faith in the future. I hope you enjoyed this show. This has been Viticulture, where we share ways to cultivate a good life. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers, and check us out on all the major social media platforms. Thanks again for stopping by.